Welcome to this week's Knowledge Nibble, where we will be discussing the principles of rehabilitation as set out by Kristen Kirkby-Shaw and others. Um, I had some great feedback last week regarding the video format, so I thought I'd do another one this week. Um, thank you all as well for your well wishes. I'm feeling much better this week, um, so thank you very much for that. Um, okay, so we're going to have a look at um, the fundamental principles of rehabilitation and musculoskeletal tissue healing um, as set out in a review paper um, of which I will pop the link in the email for you so you can it's an open access paper you can um, just click the link and you'll go straight into the paper um, and it was quite an interesting paper it's not very old it's only a couple of years old so and it was um, a group of experts um, discussing the principles of rehabilitation but with um, uh, cruise ship patients uh, canine cruise ship patients um, in mind um, but however they do say in the paper and um, it's all very very relevant information so whether you're horses or dogs or or what your interest uh, what what animal you're interested in or you work with mostly um, the paper the authors their self state that while this review specifically addresses post CCL surgery rehabilitation these fundamental principles should be applied broadly to animals enrolled in rehabilitation programs so I just thought it was quite an interesting um, view with these four principles of rehab um, for those of you that are um, uh, canine therapists or vet nurses uh, working with patients with with cruciate um, post cruciate surgery then there are some you might want to dig a little bit deeper into the paper to get some more ideas um, even if you are um, horsey and equine therapist um, I would still recommend going and grabbing the paper and just taking out the bits that interest you there's a couple of good graphs in there um, and it's just good for a bit of um, review and a bit of lateral thinking Okay, so <clears throat> we'll just run through the four principles and what I'd like to do rather than sort of dig deep into the um, the minutiae of, of the, um, the science sort of behind it, I'd rather just have a little think about uh, how this, um, how we need to think about this and how this applies to us in our practice. Okay, so the first principle is that tissues follow a predictable pattern of healing. Okay, that is the first principle that they set out. Um, I've just added a graph here that I've stolen from Tim Watson. I hope he won't mind. I'm sure he won't, um, which I've always found quite a useful, um, very sort of, it's obviously basic, but it's quite useful at just looking at those different stages of healing. Um, I'm sure you all know the stages of healing tissue repair. I've been teaching this subject for years and it's always one of the subjects that's really difficult to grasp, no matter whether you're a university student, no matter whether you're, um, doing CPD or whatever when you come back to it it's, it's a very complex subject you don't need to understand the you know every single thing about it but it is very important that you understand the different uh, stages of tissue repair um, and and it's very relevant to, to uh, working in rehab and that's why the authors have set this out as being one of the main principles that we need to um, think about or adhere to so just really briefly, like I said, I'm not going to dig into the content too much um, of the paper. Um, and it does discuss these sort of briefly. But if you I would advise you to go off and um, just have a little think about um, the tissue healing timeframes um, and just go and do a little bit more revision on those. Uh, whether you've learned it before, you know not much about it. Go off and do some reading. Um, and just refresh your memory and, and um, understand a bit more about these different phases. Um, this is a, this is very um, generalised here, but we have the inflammatory proliferation and remodelling phases. We obviously start with bleeding, which um, stops within a few hours. The first 72 hours or so will be inflammation or it peaks at, at that and it tails off over the next couple of weeks. Proliferation then peaks at about two to three weeks. And this is the stage of healing where all the um, building blocks are laid down, ready to remodel. Um, so that's the sort of uh, time where they start to get a bit more strength in there, but they're not really the, the um the building blocks have not remodeled yet um, and not strengthened and remodeled. So that's proliferation. And then remod <coughs> uh, proliferation carry on for months, four to six months or, or beyond. Um, and remodeling 
we always state this starts after 21 days or that's a traditional uh, understanding and you might actually read that when you go off and do your research um, in fact, it starts much earlier, probably within the first week, um, or it can do in some cases, and it will go on um, for a long time. So re re remodeling will happen for a long time. I mean, this is where you sort of develop. This is where we want to try and encourage the tissue to become more like the parent tissue, um, because obviously once you've had an injury, it's always scar tissue. It never goes back to being tendon, ne <coughs> never goes back to being um, ligament or muscle it will be scar um, but we want to try and make that scar to look um, as much like muscle tendon or ligament as we can um, and that remodeling can go on for a year or beyond um, you know so even when the animal looks sound happy comfortable you know we could still be in that phase so it's you know one to, to be bearing in mind if you're working with an animal you know eight months after it's had a particular injury even if it looks fine um, there's probably some remodeling still happening <clears throat> so why is it, I said <clears throat> I was feeling better this week and now I've got a frog in my throat sorry about that um in the paper there's a good graph that shows um that shows the different stages of tissue healing but I've just picked out a little bit of um information and actually probably adjusted it very slightly to 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 um, what I tend to use so if we're looking at the time for strength to return in these tissues um we want to think about why this is important. So, for example, <clears throat> say I have a horse that's six months into a tendon injury. Um, I want to know when, you know, when it happened, how severe it was at the time. And that will give me some indication at six, six months where we should be. Um, so it's just, you know, it is a best guess because you're just guessing, you know, you don't know how quickly. There's lots of things that affect the healing process, um, age, other injury, um, loads of things we're not going to go into now. So I can't categorically say at six months, if you had um, only a minor or grade one injury, um, that you'll be healed. We can't say that. Um, but it's just to get an idea Um you know what what stage i'm at and what i'm working with um it, for example if i had a dog with a fracture repair and it was three months um down the line then i should know that i'm you know healed and i'm ready to start you know doing a little bit more on that um obviously the problem is with this <clears throat> how often do you actually have a fracture that is only a fracture and there's not ligaments involved there's not joint capsule involved there's not you know other structures involved it's quite rare that you only injure one piece of this network um, and so you almost you always need to bear in mind the other parts of that um, and you know really how do you know where you are it's a best guess um, and we'll discuss that um, we'll, we'll go on to discussing that in a little more depth on the next slide and um, before I move on to the next slide though if you could just pause the presentation um, what I'd like you to just have a quick reflect on a quick think about um, pause the presentation think about a client that you're working on at the moment whether you're a therapist or a nurse somebody that uh, somebody so some animal that you have in your practice or that you're <coughs> working on um as a therapist just pause the presentation pick a pick somebody pick some animal and can you say right now what stage of healing they are at um where they are in the healing process can you do that can you quickly pull that out of your mind um and then um if you could do that before you move on to the next slide that would be great OK, so you've had um, a quick think about a patient and whether you can, you know, quickly pick out of your mind where they are in the healing process. Um, I would say if you couldn't do that, um, you couldn't quite quickly think of the patient, think about where you are um, and think about where you are in the healing process. If you couldn't do that, then I would probably suggest that you need to add a little bit more thought to where you are in the healing process when you're working with animals. So that's just a little uh, pointer um, to make sure that you keep checking back, checking back, you know, where are we in the healing process? Um, not just following a protocol that says at this stage, we should be doing such and such. We need to know our individual animals. We need to know where they are at the moment. So that's just a little something that you could maybe tweak a little bit with your practice. Right, OK, I need to move on because I'm only on principle two and I've only got five minutes left. Um, OK, so individualised treatment plans should be developed by the rehabilitation therapist and adjusted as frequently as required. The patient's progress through rehabilitation should be based on assessment of tissue healing, strength and functional abilities limitations. 
<clears throat> so let's just dig in a little bit more to what that means. We need to be doing individualized treatment plans. So it's okay to have blueprints. It's okay to have protocols, but we need to individualize them. Every time we get a new patient, we need to tweak them and individualize them for that specific patient. Um, and we also must adjust that frequently. So even if you set out a plan, you think you know what you're going to do. When you see them on a weekly basis, you need to adjust um, see what's happened, see where you are, are we on track or do we need to change it? And nine times out of 10, you'll need to make some tweak. Um, and so where it says about the patient's progress should be based on assessment of these three things. I've just pulled them out of that. So tissue healing, uh, we just discussed tissue healing, but how do we really know where we are with tissue healing? And actually there's only one way to know and that's through imaging. Um, we can palpate, we can look at um, how much pain there is we can look at lameness and see how much pain we think there is um, those of you that listened to the um, knowledge nibble last week um, you will have <coughs> uh, had a think about pain and we know that's not necessarily a reliable indicator um, so really the only way to know if a fracture has repaired or if a tendon and a ligament has healed is to image it um, and I would encourage you to try to persuade your clients um, and your vets that you're working with to do that regularly. So the other two of these are strength and functional abilities limitation. So let's just have a quick look at those. In the paper, the authors have discussed these passive and active assessments. Um, muscle mass and range of movement. So we can measure muscle mass and we can measure range of movement. Uh, both of those are more difficult with horses than they are with dogs. But it's quite a good thing to be able to measure, you know, is the range of movement improving? Is the muscle mass improving? Um, don't get disheartened if that doesn't happen for, you know, a good six weeks. It takes time for muscle to actually uh, start to gain mass. Um, but it's a, a good indicator that you can have a look at. Um, and then we move on to gait. Sorry, we move on to active assessment one of which is gait. Um, so that's obviously just looking at how they're moving. Static weight bearing. Again, this is much easier with dogs than it is with horses. Um, you can um, feel the weight bearing. You can put your hands underneath them. Um, you can, you know, have a lot more. Uh, it's a lot safer. You're not going to put your hands under horses' feet to feel the how they're weight bearing. So with horses, I tend to do that more by sort of rocking them from side to side and seeing where they're, where they're actually getting back into a comfortable position if they're shifting their weight and then functional tests in the paper so again if you're if you're a small animal have a look at the paper they've suggested some functional tests which are really sort of sit to stands and sit sit standing up um, with horses i tend to do I tend to use poles quite a lot for this. So put them over a set of poles. You can assess their proprioception. You can assess their range of movement. Um, and you can assess their posture and quite a lot just by getting them to go over a set of poles. But basically a functional test is what would be an exercise. So it's sort of, you know, can you do this? Can you sit down squarely, you know, or can you navigate a series of poles? Um, and if you can't, then obviously that's, um, uh, it's an exercise, but it's also a test. Um, so that's just a, a quick way that you can do that. I'm going to run over, but hey-ho. <clears throat> Principle three, specific, measurable, attainable and relevant goals should be set for each rehabilitation patient. So let's have a look what they mean by this. Now, there is a table in the paper that sets out the goals for cruciate patients. However, they're all very relevant. And I thought we'd just have a quick look at them to see, you know, where they're relevant for all of our patients. Um, but you can go and have a look at that table. And it does actually um, indicate what um, therapies you can use against that um, to try to um, achieve the goal. Now, it's quite funny, really, because they've said that, that these are specific, measurable, attainable, relevant goals for each patient. But then these goals are actually that they set out are actually very general. Um, so I would take these as general goals or aims, if you like. But for each patient, you need to make them specific for that patient. So degree decrease in pain, inflammation, effusion and swelling. Um, I don't agree that you want to decrease inflammation. Really, you want to help the animal move through that phase. It's an important phase. We don't just want to knock it on the head. We want to get through it and through the other side to proliferation. Um, so you won't always see a fusion. Obviously, with a, cr a cruciate, you probably will. Um, but you won't always see a fusion. You won't always see that swelling there. Um, but even if you can't see it, you know, understand that there'll be edema and inflammatory fluid around the the, um, the issue itself, even if we can't visually see that. 
Um, facilitate tissue healing. I think we can quite happily say that we want to do that with all of our patients. Um, balance tissue protection versus load. Um, so this is really, again, going back to those healing timeframes, those tissue timeframes, you know, where are we? At what stage are we at? And can we now start loading that or do we still need to protect it? Um, and so we'll we'll move through that as you sort of move into remodeling. You want to add more and more load. And that's the same for every patient. Restore muscle flexibility. Um, yes, as long as you're doing that alongside strength training. I think people get a bit obsessed with flexibility, um, but it needs to be alongside. You want to get strong and flexible, not just flexible. You know, sometimes being flexible could actually be unstable. So we don't always just want that, you know, on its own. We want that along with strength. Restore joint function and kinematics. Yes, obviously we want to do that. And that will be impaired in most patients that are injured, um, Not even if it's not the joint itself that's the issue. So you want to try and correct the biomechanics. And that's the same for every patient. Promote weight bearing and dynamic stabilization. These are two really, two different points, but then they're, they're not in the paper. Um, so promote weight bearing. Yes, that's going to be through reduction of pain and um, neuromuscular facilitation to um, train the animal to start using that limb again. And dynamic stabilization is very important. It's very important in crucial patients, definitely. But for any patient, really, um, if we've lost the muscle strength around the joint and the uh, <clears throat> correct neuromuscular uh, patterning, then we're going to have joints that are unstable. Um, so getting those muscles strong around the joints and the firing correct um, is going to help with that dynamic stabilization. Normalized proprioception, any animal that's been injured will have a uh, proprioception issue to clean up afterwards so yes that's definitely relevant for every patient restore normal neuromuscular patterning absolutely 100 percent uh very important um and is sort of the key thing that will make the difference between um a basic rehab plan and uh, one that's going to prevent further injury normalize muscle strength endurance and mass i think that's quite an obvious one and we'd want to do that with every patient even if we're looking at a horse with a, a ligament injury uh, a distal limb injury, you know, there will be muscle strength further up um, that, that is a problem and we need to address that as well. Uh, weight loss, if indicated. Yes, that's true. Um, also, you know, nutrition in general, you know, are they getting enough uh, protein? Are they getting enough uh, nutrients for what we're asking them to do and to strengthen? Uh, address compensatory issues in other limb spines. So for those of you that might be new to rehab, we're not just rehabbing the one individual limb that we're working on, we're rehabbing the whole body. Um, and, you know, we need to take a big step back and look at the compensatory problems and address all of those in our rehab plan. Hastened and guided return to activity. Of course, you know, that is really more about trying to get the owners to understand and to, to follow our advice. <clears throat> so principle four, the foundation of veterinary physical rehabilitation includes pain management, therapeutic exercise, manual therapy and guided return to activity. Therapeutic modalities may play a beneficial yet supplementary role in therapeutic plans. Client education is an important role of the rehabilitation therapist. So I've just pulled those points out here so that we can see what they're trying to say with this principle four. Um, I think pain management, therapeutic exercise and manual therapy has been covered and we, we understand that. Um, I think what they're trying to say, the authors are trying to say with this fi these final three points, guided return to activity, therapeutic modalities and client education, is that really you can't just use a therapeutic modality in isolation. Um, we need to, you, so for those of you that might have laser in your practice and are just using that for injuries, it's not good enough unless it's it's brilliant and it can be very good but it's not good enough unless you're also thinking about the whole animal and you're rehabilitating them through exercise as well and client education is obviously very key um we need to see if we can get those owners on board with what we're doing okay so that's it for this week um did I want to say anything else? What did I want to say? <clears throat> um, no, that's it, for, that's it for this week's Knowledge Nibble. Sorry, I've run over. It's always probably going to be the way. Thank you for joining me. Anyway, as always, if you have any questions about this week's topic, just drop me an email. Um, if, if you are watching this and are not signed up to the Knowledge Nibbles, but you want to be, please hop over to our website, which is animalrehabhealth.academy, um, and you can sign up for your weekly instalment there.